Today, we are yapping about five players that you must let your idiot league mates draft in Dynasty startups, okay? You need to let that shit go. You need to pass over. You need to hit the skip button like J. Cole just came up on your Spotify. Five players, Dynasty startups, and we're doing this in honor of us launching our BDGE Dynasty Leagues, okay? So if you want to join a Dynasty League, a real buy-in with other people that love Dynasty, everyone that's probably watching this, probably plays Dynasty. If you want to join a new one, if you are new to Dynasty, you're a vet, just want to add a couple more leagues to the resume, to the portfolio, very easy to do so. We're about to play the instructions. If you don't give a shit, you could skip over that. We'll have timestamps. Hello, beautiful people. Today, I'm just going to be showing you how to join the BDG Discord and a BDG Dynasty League. First of all, join the Discord, very simple. Just go to any one of our Dynasty videos on YouTube, scroll down to the description, and boom, right there. Click on this one right here, Discord. Simple as that. Now, once you are in the Discord, you're going to see a lot of channels. Don't get discouraged. It doesn't matter what channel you're in. All you have to do to join a Dynasty League is type in slash join dash league. You can even just see it here, the command. Click on that. A little message will pop up. Only you can see this. Hit join. And then it will add you to a league and you'll get a little notification that you got added to that league. You'll see here, you can see which one I got added to, add to Dynasty League 2. I'm in this group chat now and you will you should be able to see a message from most likely myself that is the invite to the Sleeper League as well as to the League Safe. You can, if you can't see them, just hit the pin messages. It should come up there. It'll be easier to find. Uh, so make sure you join those as fast as you can, because otherwise your league mates will be like, where, where the fuck is this guy? He's, he's not in the league. And it'll be confusing to figure out which one is the person who's not in the league. Uh, if you do change your mind, however, you don't want to be in the league anymore, just type in the command slash leave. And then you have to put your, your ch group chat in your Dynasty League 2. Do that command and boom, you are no longer in that channel. Yeah, simple as that. Very easy. If you ever... Uh, need a refresher on what to do, go to the join BDG Dynasty League channel and I got a full list of how to join, leave, everything. And it has all the bylaws too. All right, that's all. Peace. All the leagues are $100 buy-in leagues. All the leagues are being created within our Discord. You know what we have to do next. Let's see. All of the ranking and ADP data that we will be talking about throughout this video is from fantasycalc.com. I know a lot of y'all are familiar with Keep Trade Cut. This is a similar platform, but the difference is fantasycalc.com actually pulls in trades made on the sleeper platform. So Keep Trade Cut basically analyzes when you get onto the website, when people pick like who they'd rank above who else or whatever that's kind of like free flowing like no one really cares when they make those rankings but fantasy calc actually pulls data from real trades on sleeper so that it really shows you how the market feels about players okay so i think this data is a little bit better than keep trade cut but that's neither here nor here and get at me in the comments if you disagree i started this shit off hot i ain't gonna lie to you the first player up on this list that i am just going to let slide to my league mates when we're in the middle of the second round is the rams wide receiver 2-2 Atwell. No, Puka Nakua. Puka is currently going as the 20th overall player off the board in Dynasty startups at the 208 as the wide receiver 6. Now, I know we could look back on this, and this could be the fishiest of fish takes. Uh, Puka just smashed records across the board. One of, if not the most impressive rookie seasons of all time. The problem I have is just that I feel as if Puka's production and at least his ceiling. We're drafting him as if he is going to be putting up these numbers consistently for the for the rest of the half decade. Because you're drafting him above guys like A.J. Brown. You're drafting him above guys like Tyreek Hill. You're drafting him above guys that are in that caliber that we know are going to continuously put up the same type of numbers that Puka just put up as a rookie. So if you're confident that Puka is going to continue to go 90 for 1,500 and you know 6 to 10 touchdowns, then by all means get your nut off. But I'm looking at a few different splits, a few different situational factors that make me nervous about Puka Nakua. The first thing is the splits with and without Cooper Cup. All right. You see on the left side in split are the games with Cooper Cup. On the right side are the games without Cooper Cup. 
And they're pretty glaring splits. Obviously, on the right side, you see his half PPR points per game go up by four. His full PPR points go up by more than six. Receptions are up. Touchdowns are up. Targets are up. Receiving yards are up astronomically. So if you look at like the end of season numbers, what they would be compared to what they were based on Cooper Cup's splits of not having him in there his targets drop from 160 to 142 receptions from 105 to 88 his receiving yards 1486 down to 1337 touchdown stays the same now again those numbers are incredible uh but if you just look at the actual pace without cooper cup those numbers are all time like he would have one of the single greatest receiving seasons of all time based on the five games that he got to just inject stats into his box score without cooper cup so when i look at like startup adp i am sitting there and you're making a decision in a super flex startup of Puka or Kyler or Trevor Lawrence or AJ Brown or Garrett Wilson in these super flex leagues. And I know you could probably make the argument him over Garrett Wilson he hasn't shown us anything. Don't think he's had a real quarterback to work with, but that's neither here nor here. I, I'm just not pulling the trigger on Puka above those like franchise QBs that are both relatively young. And I get it. He's probably going like where he should be. He shouldn't be going at like the end of the third. He shouldn't be going in the fourth round. My worry is like what happens to him if any of the things that just went perfect for him last year simply don't. Like Matthew Stafford, he's old. He's injury riddled. What if he just ends up retiring? What happens in this offense? What happens if Cooper Cup does not miss time? What happens if Sean McVay retires? What happens if Sean McVay retires with Matt Stafford? It almost feels like like what would happen to Debo if Debo was not in San Francisco, if he was not with Shanahan, if Kittle wasn't always getting hurt. Like a lot of Debo's big years, he had a big year last year, obviously, and Kittle stayed healthy for the most part. But those that, that like 2021 season, a lot of that, that big production early on in his career came with one, Kittle being hurt, but two, Christian McCaffrey not being there. So again, little uh, like great players, good players for sure, not knocking the talent at all. But in terms of fantasy stats and like the upside and the ceiling of these players, a lot of it just broke right and the situation broke right. I actually want to bring up a, a tweet that I saw yesterday because the way I do a lot of my research for these is like I'll have gut feelings about players and I'll kind of write down how I feel, you know, whether it's situation or statistical or whatnot. And then I dive into the numbers, the stats to see if whether or not what I'm saying and what I'm thinking is actually backed up by those numbers or backed up by the situational things that I think are occurring. And then the last thing I'll usually do is type the player's name into the Twitter search bar filter it to like people that I follow, people that actually like do research for fantasy and see if there's any good like tidbits or any good analysis or stats that I think would add to the conversation at large. And Sam Sherman, who's a really, really good follow on Twitter, I very, very much uh, recommend you go follow him for fantasy football stuff. He quote tweeted a tweet from Seth Walder, who said the final motion report for the 2023 season. In 2017, NFL teams put a man in motion at the snap 4% of the time on average. In 2023, the average was 22%. Okay, so you're talking about an 18% increase. And when you look at the list, you see the Dolphins at number one. It's probably a reason why Tyreek Hill gets open fucking 24-7. The Los Angeles Rams are at 44.1%. Again, they're calling this, what Sam said, the cheat motion. And teams successfully adopt it. It's going to be a major storyline for the 2024 NFL season. It's almost like the tush push. Like if you execute this, it becomes a little bit of a cheat code. And the Rams are up at 44.1%. And I'm not saying like, oh, I'm not drafting Puka because I think this is going to become illegal. But again, it speaks more so to the situation of having a dude like McVay running the offense that knows what things work in the NFL. Like, look at the teams that use that type of offense. Like, the top six teams are all powerhouse offenses right now. You have Miami. You have the Rams. You have San Francisco. You have Green Bay. You have Detroit. You have Baltimore. Like, they know what they're doing, and it is equated into really, really strong offensive production so if McVay retires and they bring in a more conservative offensive coach that scares me okay so the, the biggest takeaway I would say is just like if everything stays the same for the Rams this offseason you know Stafford's fine McVay's still there whatever the case may be I have no problem taking Puka at this spot in redraft but again the long-term prospect of having a lot of stock in so many other moving parts scares me a little bit too much to grab this kid in the second round of startup drafts. The next player up on this list, and this one hurt, they all hurt to say, man. I don't want to tell y'all to fade great players just like you win fantasy championships by having great players on your team. I am just skeptical that this guy will be great, that he will be a needle mover, that he will be as great as he was last season, and that is DJ Moore. Okay, DJ Moore is currently going off the board 46th overall, which is the 410, talking about the end of the fourth round in Dynasty Startups. He is the wide receiver 15. When you look at the other receiving options around him, 
everyone above him and everyone below him. He is actually the oldest of the bunch, which was a little bit surprising to me. Like I knew he was getting up there in age. Once you play in the NFL for five, six years, that age just creeps up on you. He's 27 years old. Everybody else around him, all the players in ADP above him, all the players in ADP below him are all younger than him, which I think makes this argument a little bit stronger. Now, he's not like incredibly older than everybody. Like you have Pittman, who's a half a year uh, younger than DJ Moore, but you have dudes like Devontae Smith, who's a year and a half younger. And based on like the targets incoming into Chicago, Nico Collins, who's two years younger, like T. Higgins, I, I just don't see DJ Moore being a needle mover so much on top of those other options lower in the draft that I feel the need to jump up into where he's getting picked right now. You look at the Chicago makeup. Of course, we're excited for Caleb Williams coming there and them having like a real offense. But they also did just add Keenan Allen. That's a player who just commanded 150 targets last year. Is it more likely that now they added Keenan Allen and now they added DeAndre Swift? And this is all to say without even projecting what they do with the number nine pick, Half the mock drafts you look at have them adding Roma Dunze at the number nine pick, okay? So what's more likely? DJ Moore to get more targets next year or fewer targets next year, okay? And I want to, uh, oh, they're more accurate targets. Most of his targets were actually pretty fucking accurate from Justin Fields. If you look at the numbers, a lot of them were screen plays. So, like, I don't think it's going to be this huge bump in efficiency if the volume goes down from Caleb Williams. So it's like Keenan Allen's added to the situation. And sure, Keenan might be there one year, two years tops. When DJ Moore's 27 years old already, you don't have that long of a leash to get back to that ceiling, right? If Keenan leaves in two years, DJ Moore is going to be 29 years old, and then we're going backwards to try to rechase his prime, okay? I don't think the fall-off will be insane, but uh, I, I think he'll probably more likely than not end up delivering what he was doing back in Carolina, which was like, you know, consistently 75 for 1,100 and six touchdowns. No knock on him, but again, those are borderline replaceable numbers at like the wide receiver two, wide receiver three spot. So DJ Moore, I, I do not feel comfortable grabbing him at this point in startup drafts, and you have so much youth and so much explosion at the position and younger dudes who I think are more equipped to have higher ceiling years immediately. So DJ Moore's number two. Travis Kelsey is number three on this list. He is 81st overall right now in startups, according to Fantasy Calc. The 709. He is the tight end eight. I don't think I'm going to really tell you anything that you don't already know here. This man is going to be 35 years old soon. He is coming off the worst year of his career. Like, it's one thing to try and predict a player's age cliff. Like, what I just did with DJ Moore. If you wanted to argue that he's going to be good until 31 because of his play style, sure. I'd be, I'd be willing to be like, maybe I'm fucking wrong on that one. So it's one thing to try and predict a player's age cliff, but it's entirely different for that to show itself and then you just disregard it. And I think that's probably what's happening with Travis Kelsey here. This is a dynasty startup draft. You have the option, the ability to draft literally any player at any point in their career. You could draft players that are all in their prime right now or about to enter their prime. You should probably do that. It is so hard to recapture your prime when you're when you're older and you just show that you're no longer literally in your prime anymore. And we have this like renaissance of young explosive tight ends that entered the league for the first time in what feels like literally forever. And the gap is going to continue to widen between their values as they put up better production years, year by year by year. And Kelsey gets a year older and a year older and a year older. And you look at like every tight end going after Kelsey, they're going almost a full two rounds or more after him in startup drafts right now. And those guys include like George Kittle. I'm not saying like I want to draft George Kittle necessarily in the dynasty startup because he's always like one tweak away from missing an entire year. But he's going 22 picks later, damn near two full rounds later. He is four years younger than Travis Kelsey. He just posted better numbers than Travis Kelsey did this year in an offense that might be moving Brandon Ayuk, their number one wide receiver. Next up, you got Evan Ingram, who is one pick behind George Kittle, 23 picks later than Travis Kelsey. He is five years younger than Travis Kelsey, and he just fucking caught 116 passes, the second highest reception total by a tight end in a season ever. I don't think people realize that just happened. I didn't realize that happened until last week, and Jamo said something to me in the office about it. And now I'm looking at the numbers, and I'm like, he just caught 116 passes, and we for sure have an offense that just lost their most targeted weapon in Calvin Ridley outside of Evan Ingram. Calvin Ridley's gone. Yeah, they bring in Gabe Davis. He's not a target guy. Maybe they draft a wide. I'm just saying, Evan Ingram, like, what is his situation different last year from this year other than losing one of their top targeted guys? So Evan Ingram, two rounds later and five years younger. David Njoku, seven years younger, coming off of a breakout year, is going 46 picks later than Travis Kelsey is. Dalton Schultz, 
He is the tight end 15 right now. He's down at pick 152. That is like 70 picks later. Dalton Schultz is 27 years old. He just got an extension. Now he's locked in with Houston, locked in with C.J. Stroud. I know there's a lot of target competition, but he's like a safe floor receiver that you can get, again, 70 picks later. Schultz is one of four tight ends in the NFL that has posted 575 or more receiving yards in each of the last four seasons. It is Kittle, Kelsey, Hawkinson, and Dalton Schultz. They went out and added Rashi Rice last year, who had a major breakout and could have been a big reason why Kelsey's numbers were down. They added Hollywood Brown this offseason. I would not be surprised whatsoever if they added another wide receiver via the draft. They've been continuously doing that. Sky Moore second round, Rashi Rice second round. Like You want to give Mahomes, obviously, as much power and weapons as he could possibly handle at this point and Kelsey on the decline. So the more weapons they add, the less likely it is that Kelsey's back to those like target numbers that he was during his prime. And I know he finished this season great. He, he went great into the playoffs. I, I don't think that's a coincidence. There's a reason why a 35-year-old Kelsey who was kind of nagging, uh, had some injuries throughout the year, saved himself for the playoffs, exploded, okay? I, I wouldn't be surprised if that becomes the norm year after year for a Travis Kelsey and a Chiefs-type team. That's not good because the playoffs in the NFL – are after the fantasy season playoffs, okay? So we're looking at a guy that I feel like is not giving it everything during the regular season because he doesn't have to. He's like LeBron at this point in his fucking career. All right, so Kelsey's number three on that list. Number four on the list is Josh Jacobs, the newly signed running back for the Green Bay Packers. He is the 63rd overall player, meaning the 603. He is a top 10 dynasty running back right now, which kind of blows my mind. I think it speaks more so to the uh, the actual situation for like just running backs in general in Dynasty. I think we kind of need an influx of new, talented, younger running backs to really, really, blur, uh, to really, really break out. So when it comes to Josh Jacobs, like I, I see a few red flags. Uh, he's obviously going into a really good situation with a rising offense and like probably becomes a workhorse here. He had that offensive player of the year worthy like 2022, right? But that's sandwiched between two sub 900 rushing yard seasons that were injury riddled and while the Raiders were like a dumpster fire last year it's easy to blame it on them and it's easy to blame it on like their offensive line etc their offensive line ranked 14th per PFF in run blocking grade whereas the Green Bay Packers last year ranked 23rd let's separate from the team a little bit and let's just look at Josh Josh Jacobs he was awful on his own his own individual stats among 50 qualified running backs last year we look at PFF his elusiveness rating ranked 47th out of 50. The only running backs that were worse in elusiveness rating last year were Josh Kelly, Jamal Williams, and Kareem Hunt. That is the most cone type list I've ever seen. Those dudes are are legitimately just cones. You go look at playerprofiler.com. I want to I want to gather as many different sources as I can to make sure that what I'm seeing is real because his 2022 season was so good that I'm like, all right, let's not, you know, let's not jump the gun here, but we go to playerprofiler.com. His true yards per carry, 3.3 ranked 63rd. Yards per touch, 4.1 ranked 50th. His juke rate, which is their version of elusiveness, ranked 53rd. Breakaway run rate, 48th. Yards created per touch, 49th. Go over to Sports Info Solutions. His 12% broken tackle plus missed tackles forced per attempt, plus his EPA per attempt, one of the lowest in the league amongst running backs. 2.35 2.35 yards after contact per attempt, 47th out of 50. That's a guy who's supposed to really like run through tackles. That's a guy who's supposed to get that extra yardage after he makes contact with the first guy. He had nine runs of 10 or more yards, which was 42nd in the league, despite being 16th in carries. All right. All those numbers are just to say that it's easy to put all the blame on the Raiders being the Raiders, but Jacobs also just wasn't good himself. He's 26 years old. The contract is in Green Bay is a lot of people are saying it's a one-year contract. I went and looked at it. It's it's more likely a two-year contract than it is a one-year contract based on the way that the guaranteed money works out. But they they also brought back in AJ Dillon, which doesn't scare me because AJ Dillon is also a cone in his own right. But for his goal line work, Dillon has led the Packers in goal line carries each of the last three seasons, despite Aaron Jones being historically really fucking good at it. They wanted to give Dillon it, and maybe they will continue doing it. Maybe they won't. Maybe they will. But, like, Kenneth Walker is 23 years old, and he's going a pick behind Josh Jacobs right now. You can get quarterbacks in a super flex league like Jared Goff or J.J. McCarthy, who is basically Jared Goff but eight years younger, or explosive young sophomore wide receivers like Zay Flowers, Tank Tell, Jordan Addison, George Pickens, who's a junior— These are just guys I would rather build my dynasty around. Maybe you like Jacobs here in redraft. Sure, I got no problem with that. But in a dynasty startup, I am taking all those younger players or quarterbacks above an aging running back that I don't know is that good anymore. And the last guy on this list I am positive is not good anymore. 
is Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson is currently the 127th pick in startup draft. So you're talking about a 10th round dynasty startup draft. And if you've have, if you've done dynasty leagues before, those like 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th round picks are still super valuable. It's not like redraft. Like you want to accumulate as many of those 8th to 13th round picks as you can because that's where like the high upside rookies who people are a little bit sheepish of or that's where uh, you can get veterans that will plug holes in your lineup immediately where Russell Wilson has shown us now that he is, I mean, it's back-to-back years now, right? Fool me once, whatever. Fool me twice. He's, he's not getting any younger. At best, he is a bridge quarterback for one year for this Steelers team. At worst, the chance just start to overwhelm the Steelers brass and Fields gets onto the, onto the field and becomes a quarterback by halfway through the season, a quarter of the way through the season, right? Medium ground is that they go after a long-term solution at quarterback next year and Russ plays most of the season this year, whatever the case may be. This contract that Russ got from Pittsburgh is fucking insane. Like, his, his agent should be taken to the execution chambers for this shit. Like, I get he's been bad, but he's getting $1.2 million this year. That is like RB3 on a depth chart type money, okay? I promise you, you do not want me to start naming quarterbacks who are making more money than him. You do not want me to do that. All right, I'll do it. John Walford, Nathan Peterman, Brandon Allen. Tim Boyle is like three or four Uber Eats orders away from having the same contract that Russell Wilson has. It is bad. They have absolutely nothing tied to this man. It was a smart move by them. It's it, There's no downside to the contracts with him and Justin Fields. I get it. But this literally means nothing to them. If you think you're locking up the Steelers quarterback for the next two, three, four years, like you think you're getting cute here— Baker Mayfield, like you could, you could make the same case with Baker Mayfield. Baker was getting like eight to ten million dollars last year. Okay, so they had him in mind to be their backup quarterback at worst, one point two million dollars. All right, you're about to get smacked in the face if you are thinking Russ is anything guaranteed in this offense. And again, don't get me wrong, it's not like you're using a fifth round startup pick on him, right? He's all the way down at one twenty seven. But even at his price, this is where I'm saying like these these picks matter. You can have the 204. You could have David Njoku. You could have Tajay Spears, Brian Robinson, Jameson Williams, Josh Downs, Dalton Schultz, Jalen Warren. I would 1,000% rather have any of those guys either in my starting lineup or even on my bench in a dynasty league than maybe at best one year of like low-end QB2 fantasy numbers. All right, so count me to fuck out. All right, that is my list of five players that you've just got to let your idiot league mates draft in a dynasty startup. If you want those idiot league mates to be dudes in the BDGE audience, all you got to do is hop into the discord and type in forward slash join league. That'll put you into a dynasty league, hundred dollar buy-ins. They are set up in league safe. They are set up on sleeper. If you're new to dynasty, if you're a vet, if you just want to grab one or two more leagues to jump into, this is the best place to do so. I promise you, you ain't going to find any more competitive dynasty leagues just out there in the open with other people who are passionate about the game. Okay. I love you guys. We will be live for the NFL draft, by the way, round one, first round, full live stream, probably like six hours long. Shit's going to be a movie. I love you. I'm out.